Fair came and I heard you in. We did go. It was uh, quite fun. Me and the family uh, went and had a blast. Uh, it was got quite hot and quite busy. Really? Mm-hmm. I, mean, I will. I, uh-huh. I will say that something was very. I got very sad about. Oh, what what happened? The quality of their food every year seems to go down further and further and further. And it, uh, it makes me upset. Really? I don't think I've ever eaten food at the Ren Fair itself. No? No. I, well, when I used to go when I was younger, I didn't have nearly as much money. So like, mm. I'd have to think about, like, this food is more expensive here. I could kind of just wait it out, and we could go somewhere after, and that's usually what we would do. That makes sense. What's the food like? Trash now. <laughs> like like give me an example like what what changed the fries like do they use soggy oil now or like you know? no like typically when you go you want to eat like you know um you want to eat like really good like just food right so they got rid of my favorite thing which was they got rid of it last year it was sausage it was meat cheese and bread and i nice. felt like every time i went they had this really good sausage a big ass hunk of cheese and a big ass hunk of bread. And that's it. Right. And you just like, you're like, and you take a, I'm going to take a bite of the meat, a little piece of the cheese and a big piece of the bread. And you like make your own sandwich while you're eating. It's just like (laughs) every time. Right. Right. And, um, yeah. So firstly, last year they got rid of that. Um, and that, that made me sad. So I had to branch out and try everything else and nothing else is good. It's in, in fact, it seems like they keep just making shittier and shittier and shittier quality food. Now, I will say the roasted nuts are still good. The drinks are good. But the actual like vending stalls for food outside of sweets, because you how, how can you fuck up ice cream, right? I guess if you let it melt. Um, but yeah, everything else is kind of, you know, trashed here. Which is odd because you'd think that's where they'd make a lot of money in the food. They probably still do. Oh, they do. Bro, you know, like, so if you supposedly if you started trying to arrive after nine o'clock, which is an hour before it starts, you're in line for an hour and you can be in line for up to three hours in your car trying to get in because it's in this like enclosed off part. Now, it's the largest Renaissance fair in all of California. So that makes still it's still like huge. So by the time everyone gets in, they're like, oh man, we've been stuck in the car and I'm starving, you know? And like, so everyone's getting food. So the first time you run around to the food area, you got to get in first. So we, we left at like seven 30, got there at like eight 30 chilled in our car for a bit. And we're like still some of like the first in line. But by the time noon came around, it was just nuts to butts everywhere. Ooh. It's st- it's still in Irwindale, right? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I remember that venue. It's not the worst gonna, place. Yeah, I, I was going to get another kilt. What happened? But they were they were out of the colors that I wanted. Uh, they had like pinstripe, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be fancy when I'm wearing a kilt. <laughs> when you're wearing a kilt, you went in your kilt. Oh yeah. Did you did you do like the proper kilt method? Did you not wear underwear? Do you really want to know that, Giacomo? I don't. Maybe the audience does. <laughs> <laughs> No, I wore underwear because I'm not a heathen. Oh, okay. uh, when you're when you're walking around out, out there, like if you don't wear underwear, it's just dust everywhere. <laughs> and like, like just imagine not wearing underwear, wearing a skirt, going to the Ren Fair, bro. You're just gonna get dirt right in your ass crack. <laughs> dusted like, nuts. <laughs> dusted nuts all day. Like imagine, <laughs> imagine. You know. <laughs> I will say that. Um, uh, I'm not trying to roast these nuts, you know? Um, <laughs> wearing a kilt to the Ren Fair is so freeing and it's so breezy. It's so it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. My wife this year got me at one of the um the nut bags. Mm-hmm. 
It's just like a bag that hangs on your dick and you're supposed to put rocks in it. Right. So that when, when wind comes, you know, it doesn't like lift it up and everyone can see your, your precious jewels. Right. Oh, is that what it's? Yeah. It's a nutsack. <laughs> Damn. That guy's got huge nuts. His skeleton isn't even flying up. <laughs> <laughs> so I just oh. put my phone in it, you know, and I was like, Oh, this weighs as much as, you know, a bunch of normal rocks. And, you know, I was like, Showing off Hobby Highlander while I was there, you know, it was uh, not really, but you know, it was in spirit. You're like, I feel like me- I, at least, at least two people at the Ren Fair have had to have watched Hobby Highlander by now, right? I mean, we have 3,000 views. So at least I'm, two, <laughs> at least two, at least two, maybe more. Who knows? Yeah. Speaking of High- Happy Highlander, it's been, it's been going quite good. We have, um, it's our, one of our most viewed videos now. Which is surprising because uh, when it first released, it was only like 300. And I remember you and I were talking about it and just like, oh, okay. It probably was like, it flashed in the pan. We'll keep, you know, we'll keep improving it and it'll get better as time goes on. Mm-hmm. And um, it keeps just then getting one, views. Then one day it was at, so it was like, we were looking at it, it's like 375. And then like the next day it was like at a thousand. And I was like, cool. You know, and I went to the Ren Fair and I painted on Saturday, Sunday. And I looked this morning and we're sitting at 3000. I was like, oh, well. You know, and we have, I think, plus 240 subscribers. So thank you, everyone who went out and subscribed to us. Yes. You know, thank you. You're on. We for got, helping us get our goal of a thousand. We got a couple comments that were, you know, helpful and trying to help us out. You know, um, I don't know if everyone knows what goes into making a Hobby Highlander episode and why sometimes some of the uh, comments are difficult to put into effect. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the behind the scenes, uh, talking about Hobby Highlander and some other stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about some other videos that we have thought about and thinking about making, and also to end it all off, kill team stat. You know, hobby's part of the ho- hobby's part of everything. So you know, stick around and listen for a while. What what does Deckard Kane say? Stick around and chat a while. I think so. Some, some, he doesn't say chat, but yeah, that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> yes. All on the squad games podcast. Yeah. And then tomorrow and then next week, hopefully we'll have a very special guest on to talk about pathfinders and why pathfinders are still good. Hey. hey. And why they might just be the best. Absolutely. Um, now we haven't seen any of the kill team stats. So when we look at them, um, I haven't looked in quite some time because I've been very busy so i'm going to be quite excited to see i too look forward to these stats <laughs> i want to see i want to see how um how the two new teams are performing because i'm i have to assume at this point people have been using them you know absolutely those the absolutely. rule sets can't be ignored you know mm-hmm. so um hobby highlander man it's been a journey and a half making that. Yeah. And yeah, no, it all started from a, a phone call. You told me like, we should do a show like this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, then one Sunday we recorded it and then it happened mm-hmm. and it was done and it was real. Uh, and it felt like such a blur because so much happened at so fast. Um, now that we've made a few, at least a few in the pipeline, they're in development. It's, Interesting to reflect on what it takes to make them. Absolutely. You, like it's, it's, a, it's a lot more work. I don't think I've done a production this big in a long time. And uh, I missed it. I miss doing this kind of stuff. It's fun to, to go set up a studio. It's fun to get everything ready for recording. It's fun to edit. And it's fun to you know, redo your edits, the parts that need to get changed. And then it's fun to finally produce and finish. It's been my very first production outside of security. I've seen huge productions happen <laughs> and behind the scenes on a lot of stuff, but I've never actually worked on a production or been like the executive producer or like storyboarding or any of that kind of stuff. And, you know, Hobby Highlander is very much just a live show. So, like, 
we try to be as honest and as fast as possible. Obviously, we're a little controversial sometimes, you know, um, because like just a paint that we test is like super underperforming. And now we have thoughts and reasons why some of those things happen the way they do. Um, but it's really hard to like sit there and be entertaining and get into technical reasons why pain is possibly behaving the reason it is, especially when we don't know the brand, you know? And there's been one brand that's been heavily underperforming and uh, our comment section is definitely letting us know. <laughs> They're starting the flame war there. <laughs> they sure are. But before we get into, into a, a brand that's, I mean, they've done well, but I don't know if they've ever placed last. They've gotten you know? close. They've gotten close. Have they? Yeah. But they've okay. never been last. Yeah. They should have placed one more time, but we'll, we'll get to it. Um, and some, sometimes our biases come out, even when we specifically know the paint. You know, like right now we're currently editing the gold episode, which so. Let's 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 start it off, Giacomo. So, um, day one, we came in and we set up cameras for like five hours <laughs> and audio, and we're like, "Hey, what's the best way to capture audio? What's what are we gonna do here? What are we gonna do there?" And we filmed three episodes on day two, right? Yep. Um, do you want to tell us the colors? Because I mean, I think it's fine to tell the people the colors that are. Yeah. Out. So we, we did our first episode, which is white. And the next one, like you mentioned a little bit ago, is gold. And last for the original three were silver. So a lot of the techniques we used in those have now adapted to the new stuff we've recorded. You know, we've, we've yeah. changed stuff that didn't quite work. Because um, we had a lot of. We had a lot of like internal thoughts about how things worked. Um, things that we wanted to change. And we had our first like test run to viewers to see what they thought made some additional changes. And then we, um, I think it took us about three weeks of editing the first episode because it was so long. So I was an idiot. The first time we did it, uh, I brought out eight paints. That's the reason why the first episode took an hour and 40 minutes to record. It was, it was very long. <laughs> and, and the recording process wasn't so bad, more of like, well, you have an hour and 40 minutes of footage you got to look through. And there's not obvious spots where like, oh, this was a take that had to be redone. So you scrapped this part. It's easy to cut out. No, everything is used. So now we have to condense this down into something else, you know, and try to remove any of the slow parts, too. So you're, you're rewatching parts after parts that I'm spending maybe 20 minutes on a on a five minute segment just going through and making sure. Does this make sense if I cut this out? Does the flow still work? Because there's yeah. nothing worse than watching a video and like there's something like a, a you know drop off the cliff and you're like what and then the video continues like nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's always fun in quotes. It's always fun to do. So I'm glad <laughs> we've 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 figured out an amount of paints to use now, mm -hmm. which the is right six. six right now. Yes. So also like we had prep days up leading up to this. Like we had Rob come out film. Uh, we did our our podcast with rob immediately after we had him you know dress up and we went into the uh the back uh the woodlands back here desertlands the mountains no the mountains and film some um quentin tarantino pan shots which we use quite heavily in the episodes um but that was like that was a whole production itself, a, just a literally that two, one day, yeah. A week or two weeks before we even recorded our first episode. Yeah. First three had, episodes. We just had the footage, just so we can get it ready. Yeah, so after that, we put in a bunch of different things, different ideas, um, and we filmed our next three, and then the first episode went live. And uh, no, I think, I, think, I think it went live, and then we recorded the next three episodes, literally Correct. the day after. Yes. The, so, right we, after. so we got a lot of initial feedback right away. And so now we have three more. Gee, what are the next three colors that we do? Uh, the next three colors we do. I, I've been going back and forth between what to call this one. I've been saying Jade, other people have been saying cool green. So um, it's one of those two. We'll, we'll decide our name in a moment. 
and we did blue and then we did black. Now, specifically the reason why we, why we did Jade is our, is our least interesting color, but we changed some things drastically of how we record things on OBS. And, uh, it's the specific multicam feature where we can record, record multiple cameras. And it was our color that we could lose and not feel too upset about. Exactly. Unfortunately, uh, in black, we had a lot there, of issues. There, there's a lot of issues in that production. And um, you will notice them, you know, because editing will take care of a lot of that. But know that there was a lot of issues in there. There was There's quite a few issues uh, that I'm currently hammering out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's getting there. It's getting there. It's looking nice. Uh, and and re- contra- contrary to what I, originally I had thought and what Dakota currently thinks, I think Jade is a lot more fun of a video than it than it is. Is it? Uh, I think I have. I'm having more fun with it. It's because I'm fucking colorblind, dude. I I don't care about the color. <laughs> you can't see it. <laughs> well, you can see some of them. Yeah, there's a hidden joke in it that you guys will see afterwards. That you know. Yeah, we'll get there in time. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's the process of Hobby Highlander really comes down to doing set up the days before so that the next day, you know, we, we're, we're on a time limit with the cast and the crew that we have. We have to finish it within the next what usually we have about and babysitting. Four, yeah, we have about four or five hours to work with it. Mm-hmm. So we got to knock that out. And usually we can get it just just about just about the time we were expecting to do it. We might run like a little bit over. But it's not that bad now, you know, we're, we're, we're streamlining it and that's a big thing is streamlining it to get it ready to film. So like the cameras have already been set up and they're not moving for the most part Yeah. until we record something else then we have to move them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the other thing that's interesting is that after these first six episodes, we're changing up our test palette. We're adding another little section for how many times does it take a paint to, uh, for something to count as fully opaque and then we're cutting our dry brush section in half so that we can try like stippling or freehand or mixing a color or something like that and then we're adding a little edge highlight area to it too so um but then you know make it it better to to test out a paint yeah because we're we're also learning and making things better behind the scenes as as we're doing it right because we have to we can't record like one episode a week right like Alex drives in, um, you know, we have to set up babysitting. It's a, it's a whole thing. So, right. We may as well try to get as many as we can at once. Yeah. It's pretty, it's been, it's been fun. Also, we have like a little chart of like colors that we're thinking about or what other colors people want us to do. And now the good thing is, is now we also have war paint fanatic. Um, unfortunately our first six episodes, we we've recorded all of them. Before they they released they released them singly that they, they they did <laughs> they did have giant paint packs of it but I'm not going to spend three hundred to five hundred dollars on an entire paint range that'd be oh, even crazier than what I'm currently doing. I'm not against it, but I get where you're coming from. <laughs> what if they suck, dude? That's exactly the next thing. Like, what if they're bad? And I want I want Army Painter to have a line of colors. That isn't that does that doesn't have the stigma of like army painters bad, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think from all the stuff that we've heard on YouTube, they've definitely got away from that. But I've also heard like, you know, they definitely have to be thinned down, which is not a bad thing. I'm very much looking forward to painting with them and trying them. Like we have a couple cool ideas uh to in- introduce the range and all that kind of stuff. So um yeah it's been it's been interesting also figuring out the audio if the audio is going to work while doing everything but i think we should address the elephant in the room about about the first uh monument paint that came out a monument bold titanium white and heavy and heavy there's a lot of monument stands out there which is good you know um i think that ha- having being a fan of a paint range is good and I honestly think that Monument White is still a really good paint. In fact, I scored it 80. Just no one seems to actually watch the full video that wants to hate on us for putting ranking Monument solo. Um, even though, you know, um, 
was Giacomo's favorite paint. He 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 gave I rated it, a it lower. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just, thing- it's a blind test. Like, what do you do? You know, like we have absolutely. To, we go based on the metrics in front of us. Like, if I see a paint doing that, I'm going to give it a certain score, right? Yeah. Like it's reacting weird in a way that as a new pl- a painter, I'd be like, I don't want that to do that. So we have a lot of people saying that, you know, you're supposed to use Monument Hobby primer with it, uh, which seems weird that to use a hobby paint without having any issues whatsoever, you're supposed to use their primer. I get it. But at the same time, uh, Giacomo, don't you have a, you want to test something out? I do. I plan on painting my Night Lords using as much of Pro Acryl as I can. This includes the primer. I got the primer. I got my airbrush ready. The models are pretty much set up and ready to get primed. And then I get to test it. Because I, I want to prove to myself that these paints do well. Because I did love and still do like bold titanium white and the handful of few other colors that I owned before this. But now mm-hmm. I want to try it on a team. Uh, it doesn't even matter on a team, just any models in general, but I want to try it using all their methods that they're supposed to, to do. Right. To me, this is already marking it out of like a really, so monument is a fantastic paint. In fact, I'm using certain monument paints on my veteran guards as well. Right. Like I think it's a great paint. I just think that it sticks really well to itself. And I think that it sticks really well to really matte surfaces, but you have to be pre-prepped and pre-know like how you're going to attack project if you're going to use Monument rather than like, uh, I think Alex has told us quite a few times now that he's just been um, having issues with Monument and having to disrupt your workflows while using Monument Hobby Paints is, can be challenging. To say the least, you know, if you, you, what if they don't have monument primer? What if you're out and you have to use chaos black, you don't have an airbrush. So now like, okay, now it's just not going to stick to chaos black. Right. It seems, it seems that. wild. seems yeah, wild. Yeah. Especially if you throw away all of your Citadel paints, like Ninjon did recently. Uh, you know, it just seems like, I don't know. It's just weird. Um, so like, for me, like you're going to score lower if your paint can't function the best in any circumstance, right? In the, in the given, the most common circumstance, which um, not to defend GW's paint line, they, they have a couple good colors I like, but for the most part, their brand is so big that they don't really have to worry about getting new colors right away. Because sure, there's, there's better colors of them, right? There might be better mm-hmm. versions of it. But the first thing you think of when you buy a GW kit for the first time is, well, what do I need to paint this? And what do they have right there next to it? And what is the shop owner going to tell you? You, Especially if you're buying from a GW, check out these paints we have right here, right? They got Dude, most most stores only have Citadel. Exactly. Because they they force you to, not force, but it comes when you buy Games Workshop products. You're going to get their paint too. So naturally, you're going to buy the paints that are right there. That's going to be your first paint. So they're always going to make the sale on paints, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you, so they don't really have to worry about being better than Vallejo, uh, Army Painter, or Pro Acryl because you, you're going to buy those the first time and maybe you might end up liking them. But as you progress in your paint journey ship, you will find other colors that you prefer or paint brands that fit your painting style more, right? Mm-hmm. So, so they call you, it. I think they call it the like the the mouth of the hobby. The deeper and the longer you play war games, the smaller the funnel gets because you start to find 3D prints or other things, different paint ranges, and you start going down the, the hole of stuff. When at the beginning, it's just like, hey, here are the spray paints. Here are the paint. Uh, here are Citadel paints. Here are our brushes. That's pretty much what you buy when you're playing a Warhammer. Uh, and then you're going with model color for like historical, right? Because right, that's what's typically there. They advertise it like they straight up as a historical color line for it. But the point is, you know, like those, the GW is like the first one you're going to see. So as a new player coming in and asking that question, 
you probably have the GW spray, right? You probably have Chaos Black. You probably have uh, Wraith Bone or something. So these other paints should work in line with the most common one you're probably going to use. At least that's how I look at it from this blind test, right? Like it should be the most common thing being used is the stuff it should work the best with. But it doesn't always happen. And that's all right. Because once you get to specialist stuff, you will end up using specialist stuff. You know, like uh, for the example of Protocrel. you They're saying you should use their primer. So now maybe we should try it. And maybe that is the way to use their color, like the best way to use their color, right? Not the only yeah. way, just the best way. Well, I think where Monument is struggling lately, in at least the first episode, um, is just adhering as a base coat to to a primer. I know for a fact it can it can adhere to itself pretty well, and sometimes it has an issue. Like contrast also has this issue where it has separation, or the paint uh, starts to break, or um, it starts to separate uh, while on the model. Right, so like. It's just interesting that I didn't think with the amount of hype that you see around bold titanium white, you would not expect these simple issues to exist. Exactly. And to me, that's what's kind of alarming, right? Is that there are simple, simple problems with this paint that is supposed to be the best paint out there for the, as, as I've been quoted on, on our, on our comments, the best the best white to ever, the best white paint ever, right? Um, I don't think that's true. I think that it's great in certain applications. Like for instance, um, white scar was the longest drying paint. (laughs) Like I was sitting there blowing on it for fucking ages. Like it was insane, but I like the way it covered. You didn't Giacomo. You kind of came around to it uh, towards the end of, of of our blind test, but um, what white scars actually seems like it'd be really good for without any kind of additives is probably wet blending. You know, it takes so long to dry. Um, it'll probably be a really good wet blend paint, right? So, like, I, I think <clears throat> I think looking at paints, like, obviously, we're making a show and we're making something that's like really supposed to be entertaining, and obviously, trying to find. What is, because even our flat, our flat uh, test things is like, that's like the most stress that you will ever put under a paint, right? What is the hardest thing for a paint to do? To cover a large flat surface evenly with one coat or two coats or three coats, right? Like sometimes it can be easy if you're just doing like the tip of a boot, you know? Okay, well, just took two coats and it looks good enough. Um, stressing the paint really um, can show some of some of its weaknesses. It's something that I've enjoyed, and I've come away with some interesting takes on different brands. Do you have any uh, interesting takes? Like I have a couple. When it comes to the brands in general, yeah, just like the brands that we've tested in general. Now we haven't tested War Paint Fanatic yet, so I have nothing on them. <laughs> I don't I don't have any like crazy hot takes outside of the usual where I would say like Games Workshop generally is all right. It's a beginner paint. And I remember reading once years ago that they would say the same thing about Vallejo, but I don't think that's true anymore, especially with some of the newer stuff they've come out with. Um, Vallejo has like some of the punchiest colors. They're a really pretty brand of paints. Yeah, their really game color is, is is always been phenomenal, and we never really had a, a here in the states to get as much Vallejo. They were they're around, but just not as as accessible as now. They're really pushing game color in stores, yeah. right? We're seeing them in other stores, not just in a in a specific hobby store that has Vallejo paints for like trains or something. Didn't you tell me that they're coming out with the model color? Because dude, there are some model colors that I just adore. Yes, model Vallejo. color. Uh, if I remember reading right, unless. Uh, I'm getting some sort of like Mandela effect. The model color range is getting refreshed as well. If I, if I recall correctly, which is awesome because that's what they did with game color and I'm liking game color. Yeah. A so, lot. yeah. So the cool thing about model color is, um, 
Model Color has some really good desaturated paints. They have a lot of good like color renditions. They also have like the famous ice yellow, and every single brand now has an ice yellow, which is something that we want to test. What's the best ice yellow out there? It's a great highlighting tool. It's a great high uh, mixing paint, right? Um, ice yellow and like and like the the light ice blues are really really like, and even ivories are really important for. Um, not pastel, uh, pa- uh, like desaturating your colors when you're when you're adding to them. Mm-hmm. So you can keep warmth in them, or you can keep coldness in them. It's very, very good stuff. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited for the the future of Hobby Highlander, and like we're going to be doing not just paints. You know, we want to do like paint palettes and brushes and clippers and uh, Other anything that. Things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not just for painting stuff. So if you guys are interested in like joining and checking it out, flaming us when we flame our own paints, because we don't know. Dude, I <laughs> I was so confident that one of them was pro acryl too. And then then it turns out, nah, that shit was something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like a hundred percent confident, and then I was absolutely dead wrong. So I don't think that we've ran into a single time where we have tested paints and they've all been like super close. There's always been one or even two. I would say in the next couple episodes, there's been two paints that perform really, really, really well. Um, really, there's not. I would say third place doesn't really exist. It's kind of like there's some really shitty paints. Then there's like the mid range, which is like really close. And then usually the top two paints are pretty close. Usually the, the top paint is by far the best. It's outstanding. Like it's, it's a color that's outstanding. It may not be the perfect application for everything, but the first time you use it, you definitely are impressed with this color. So out of all the, the, the six different paints brands that we've tested so far, your, and don't name your favorite color, but what episode is your favorite paint? that you've tested so far. It is the silver episode. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. <that one>. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I won't say what Alex says, but uh, that was, that was my favorite single sentence that lasted, you know, two seconds. Like, yeah, uh, it was just that, that summed up how I felt about this so much that I, I did do what he said in that comment. Um, Oh yeah. I, I own that color. <laughs> mm. So there, yeah. In the silver episode there. So there's these things that I call magic paints, right? Um, they replace anything and everything. Uh, and they are just like magic in a bottle. And there is a silver paint that is just magic in a bottle, uh, by far. Um, like I really think another, um, Magic in a bottle paint is um, dirty down. Uh, so the rust effects and pretty much all the effects from uh, dirty down is just like phenomenal. Like you just apply it and you're done. There's no need to sit there and push pigments around for a long time. Is it random? Absolutely. Can you fuck up your paint job? Maybe. Um, but they are, if you want to get something rusty, rusty or dirty, you just put it on, right? So it's like it's that kind of level of of power, and that paint in silver has it, power. It, that's how I feel about the Hobby Highlander. When you use that color, you're like, whoa! Mm-hmm. And if you even if you never use any other paints from that company, but you get the Hobby Highlander because it just feels so good to use, then we're, then then I'd, I'd feel happy. Yeah. You know, white was by far the best I, white. I was so impressed and everywhere you go to get this color they're always down to like a few left or sold out <laughs> or sold out it's it's the same it's the same uh i don't want to say the same hype but it definitely feels like the same hype to a different paint i bought the first time when everyone was telling me that um i like it absolutely so, so you should watch the episode if you haven't the link is in the show notes of of this episode, or you can find us squad games entertainment on YouTube. Just type in hobby Highlander, 
white paint and that'll, that'll get you the video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or squad games, hobby Highlander. Um, unfortunately when you type anything with, with just hobby Highlander, just Highlander stuff will pop up. And if you type anything with squad, just squad games, um, squid games will pop up. So uh, we have to be actively found on YouTube's. That's unfortunate, but um, there are like a, some really good, exciting stuff that we are definitely planning on doing. So I'm quite excited. Uh, like for instance, a video that another video that I'm editing and working on is um, how to paint Master Chief. Um, and you can listen to a guy who's colorblind paint green really, really well. Um, at least I, Giacomo, would you say that it's painted well green? Yeah, I've seen the colors, um, the results after I like it. Yeah. So when, when people are colorblind, they really have to either make a recipe or find a recipe and then paint like that and paint with those colors. Um, so that, you know, what's coming out is like what's supposed to come out. Oh, um, oh I need to interrupt. So mm -hmm. I went on a separate browser that doesn't have any of my history or information. I typed in Hobby Highlander and we're the second result. Really? Yeah. You can just wow. type in Hobby Highlander. It'll find us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Squad games. There we are. We're, we're number two. Amazing. Okay. Oh, cool. no. Number one. The first one's an ad. <laughs> it, it might be because the video is starting to gain traction. I'm thinking that's what it is. So there you go. You can just type in Hobby Highlander. I just wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to hear your reaction. So we're going to be at the Hobby, or not Hobby Highlander. We're going to be at um, the Bay Area Championship at Mad Alpaca Games. Uh, if we hit 40 players, signed up, bought tickets and registered by, when is the date? I'll have to have time to make these. So this is why we're going to, I'm putting a date on it. I believe what's what the 20, the weekend of the 25th, because it goes on to the Memorial Day weekend. So, yeah. So if we get everything bought and sold, 40 players signed up by May 17th, I will be adding best in faction token, uh, best in faction medallions for uh, all teams who have two players signed up. Um, and when we hit 30, I'll add something else. And if we hit 50, I'll add more stuff. So um, I'm looking to, you know, incentivize people to get more tickets and do that kind of stuff. So um, to please buy your tickets early because if we hit 40, but we don't hit 40 by the 17th, currently we're sitting at 18, right? But I know no one from so SoCal has bought tickets yet. Yes. That again, this is going to be in Fairfield, California. That is up north. Yeah. Um, anyone that's, uh, I already know like two people from Ohio that are coming. I don't know if anyone from Portland or anywhere else is, are looking to come. Uh, I know that a lot of the bats have already signed up a lot of, um, um, some of the other teams up there have already signed up as well. So please get your tickets early so that we can give it, Cause I think we're going to hit 40 at least. So instead of waiting to the last day or the last two days, um, because we're probably going to cut off tickets two days in advance because we're going to have to pack and then we have to put them in a trailer, travel up, and then we have to, you know, get everything out. We're going to stream it. So we're going to have all the stuff, right? Um, you know, so, I mean, if we don't, if we sell zero more tickets and only 18 people show up, then we're not going to stream, <laughs> you know, um, but I highly doubt that's going to happen. So. Um, <clears throat> But right after that, two weeks after that, we have our anniversary tournament here in Santa Clarita, California, where we first started our very first. Uh, this will be uh, the beginning of year of year three, right? Um, so we're looking to make that at least 40 players as well at Loaded Dice Games, which is a local store. Uh, and then there's a really large gap until um, the All Valley Team Tournament. So if we hit 40 for that event a week before, I'll also make faction tokens or fact, best in factions for everything there too, just like we saw at LVO. So um, get your friends, get your families, get them signed up and we'll, uh, you know, we'll make it happen. Uh, running really big tournaments, hopefully. Yeah. So. 
and we'll have uh, those tickets available for you in the show notes of this episode. Mm-hmm. If you're doing it on mobile, it tends to work better than if you're doing it on desktop. And if not, you can always check out the website at lustersworkshop.com slash squad games to get tickets as well. Yeah. And if you can't make it to either one of those, come to the All Valley Team Tournament. It's a 1v1v1 tournament. It's the best tournament we run. It's a lot of fun. We rent it out of space. So we're looking to, uh, we're looking to, to, you know, make that again, our, our best event. So yep. Two days in, in September, we mm-hmm. have a whole thing planned to go to a bar after with everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just, uh, you know, it's there's be a, a really, time. there's a really cool painting competition. That's correct. Um, the forge, the brush. forge brush. It's coming back again. It was pretty popular last year. Um, a lot of really good entries. So I think uh, first place, uh, best overall took home in Anvil. So uh, pretty cool stuff. You so can if have you're, an Anvil too. <laughs> you can have an Anvil too sitting on your desk. And of course, a series of down. paints. Because <laughs> uh, you can't paint with an Anvil, but uh, you can paint no. with the paints that you get for winning. <laughs> you can paint on the Anvil. You can paint on the Anvil. You can paint yeah. the Anvil. You mm. can. You can do that too. Mm, I hope the you know you bring a really nicely painted anvil as your entry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, so those tournaments are coming up. So look forward to those. Again, you can find them either in the show notes or you can go to lustersworkshop.com slash squad games to purchase tickets. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Giacomo, what are you working on right now? Like I mentioned earlier, I'm getting the Night Lords. So once again, I have put my Votan to the side and thrown them away. I'll pull them out of the garbage at some point. But right now, Night Lords are the priority. Uh, we are doing the Provocrill thing. I'm getting the primers. I already have them. So I'm uh, going to go ahead and find some time later this week. Put them all on the sticky tack uh, things that Mr. Alex printed out for me. And then I'm going to hit them with everything and start painting them. Because uh, I look forward to playing Elite Teams again. Um, I'm very excited. GW making elite teams great again. Finally. Well, one elite team great. One elite team. The rest ha- are rotting in a grave somewhere. Big sad. I, I am genuinely upset. You might not be able to tell from here because I'm generally chipper and happy, but I am genuinely upset that elite teams aren't as good because I love elite teams. And it's not so much because I'm lazy and don't want to paint a bunch of guys. Um, that's a different reason. I, I genuinely like the power fantasy of big dudes running around and just like killing things, you know? I think it's cool. I think the best day Kill Team has ever had, hot take coming in, mm-hmm. is the day Intercession released. I would uh, 100% agree. I remember, this is an old story, sitting down, tying my shoes up, getting ready to go to work, and it's Thursday. We were going to play Kill Team, so I had my... I had my Phobos in the container, and then I just quickly look at the internet while I'm waiting, and I see Intercession popped up, and I thought, all right, I'm going to throw this box away and go and get my Intercession. And that's exactly <laughs> what I did. <laughs> I was going to play them that day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember going into work that day, and that's literally all we talked about. Like, we were talking about it for like a week beforehand, <laughs> what we would do, like what why GW needed an Intercession team, and it came out the blue, and it was by far... One of my favorite drops of Kill Team that I've ever had. Like yeah. all we we just talked about it nonstop. I think the next day, uh, or was it the same day? Like we came back and we we recorded the podcast, and then you went out and played them. I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we had recorded it then, and then we were like, we're going to release it after. But we had manifested it, or at least we believe we manifested it, because we were talking about it at lunch break right before, and then the next day happened. 100% or oh, man, what a beautiful day. And you know what? I don't know if we're going to have that kind of release, and that's okay. As long as we still get releases for the game and we're having a good time and everyone's enjoying what they're playing. Well, Giacomo, there is something very interesting that released that a lot of people missed. On May 9th, 2024, we had a April 9th. R- April 9th. We had a rumor engine come out saying i'll read it to everyone it looks like a a gothic window and says some eyes say the window what the fuck hold on some say the eyes are the window to the soul but the only windows we care about are the kind that let you shoot through them without without impediment if you're within one inch which is a triangle it says one triangle of the cover line crossing the obscuring terrain. 
That's a Kill Team reference, by the way. And if you didn't get it, play more Kill Team. You heard and it here. De- and then at the bottom, it says, that's looking decidedly gothic. And unless Pontifex, Pontifex Zenestra has felt a sudden urge to dye her hair white and a tattoo of fleur de lis onto her face. That means we're in the 41st millennium. Uh, that should narrow it down a bit. So give us your best guess over at Facebook, Instagram, and X, which used to be Twitter, but it is, it is not. Um, so there's a couple things that we can take away from this. Number one is that there's a new terrain set coming. That is city. Yay. I'm genuinely happy. Number two, it's not that at all. It's just a piece on a base and it's going to be a new sisters team. But they're talking, right? they're talking about cover line within one inch. I think it's new terrain. And I think that that's going to be uh city. A, you, you think in city fight? I'm thinking it's city fight. Now, Valrat keeps saying Kill Team is going to the skies. Heaven forbid. Um, First, we're in a spaceship. Then we're in water. And then we're in the skies. Can we just fight in the open? I mean, I mean, you could be in like skyscrapers. No, he keeps saying like uh, swooping hawks and vespids and. No, and and all flying team is uh, not not that I said they wouldn't release it, but. There's always been an issue with flying teams, right? It's one thing to have an operative that flies. It's another thing to have operatives that fly. Well, the other, the other issue is, is that they, the next edition is supposedly right around the corner. So if that's the case, like we could see fly reworked Giacomo. Maybe it's not as big of a problem as uh, maybe you can move through your own models now. So, you know, only like, because because whenever any GW game has had fly, it's awesome. Like you can you can just ignore movements, right? It's awesome, and that's cool in a big scale thing where like my flyer is gonna go drop a bomb on dudes. Um, in kill team, it can be cool when there's like a guy who does it. It's the same issue with like obscuring. Like if the whole team can do it and do it really well, it starts becoming a problem. Versus, like, uh, just one guy can do, you know, remove obscuring. You kill the dude, or you know, you just get out of its way. You're fine. But mm-hmm. um, when your whole team can do a- a- inherently an ability that changes or doesn't follow the rules, it becomes a little bit of a problem, right? Absolutely. So I would prefer if teams don't have a hundred percent fly or a hundred percent abilities to remove obscuring or some crazy rule. If it's like one or two guys, it's workable. That's fine, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm hoping they don't go to this guy. I'm hoping it's City Fight and it's just a fun new way to play. And it makes sense, City Fight, right? Because in a city, you're going to have guerrilla guerrilla fighters, right? And that's like small groups of people shooting and running away. It's, it's what you do in Kill Team. So it's perfect. Yeah. And I mean, they, they kind of like added things to beta decimal that's not competitive that would f- fix part of beta decimal like swimming and a few other things i mean which i could see <sighs> and then the new terrain piece that they added from nightmare is a good piece it's a new Agreed. piece of heavy and they have the rule of stairs so that means now we can incorporate stairs into different parts since now there's a rule for it written by gw Exactly. I mean, unfortunately, Beta Decima just needs work in order to make it work. So, we'll I think, to- but they're, they're, they're stepping in the right direction by giving you the ability to be able to climb onto the gantries, which mm-hmm. is where a lot of the fighting will happen. And being able to just get on there as teams who normally have a tough time climbing is a big improvement. It's not fixed it, but it's a big improvement. And I can, I can start there. And I like that. Totally agree. Unfortunately, none of those are actually competitive. Currently. Currently. Yes. So. <clears throat> but hey, so you Jim, know what? We, we'll give it time. We have something else. Um, I've been painting up my team for um, Dallas. 
and I wanted to get your take. Now you saw like a pre rendition of it, but I think I've made it better. And then I, I want to ask the disc, um, our discord. Um, if you guys would like to see a, if you would like to see a tutorial for this, please let me know because I think I am the first and maybe the only person that's done this. Um, I, I, at least I haven't been able to find anywhere else that actually has, has actually done this. So I made up my own recipe, colorblind and all, and I think it came out really well. But Giacomo, I sent you some photos of this guy. I want to get your first reactions. My first reaction is I like the color scheme. My second reaction is this is an interesting choice. And not in a, not interesting in like a bad way. I like it. Because mm-hmm. I don't see these colors generally used for this, right? Mm-hmm. It almost feels kind of like, especially this dude with the little hat, kind of reminds you like this dude's like a fisherman. But I know he's not, but it's cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what's interesting is this, this is the way I'm doing the rest of them now. The first one I sent you, I, I did a little bit differently before. Okay. So... Uh, so everyone knows what we're talking about. I painted yellow leather. So cowhide leather, you guys kind of see the... I can see uh, the stretching and stuff on it. The cowboys that have like just the the yellow on it, you know? And it's just, it is yellow. It, 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 it's, a, it's a leather, you paint it like leather. So you have like the aged look to it. But there are the different, a different, I only use three colors. Um, so it's, it's really, really simple. And I don't really want to show off these guys until, until, um, Dallas. But if, if, if if you guys are interested in seeing, um, you know, a, a, some sort of tutorial for yellow leather, then let me know. And I'll, I'll probably make one. Um, and the, the coolest thing about this G is so i have a very neutral base right so like my color scheme itself is very very neutral right like everything about the model is very neutral and then the points of color that are really because even silver is neutral so the points of color that really come out are the leathers so you see a lot of the yellow leather and then i also have a lot of i I don't have a lot but i have some brown leather that also pops out so like with the two really warm tones, it really become, it's interesting to, to, to paint guardsmen. And then usually what everyone tries to hide are like all the bags, the grenades, you know, the, the, the boots, the boots and all that kind of stuff. Like everyone tries to be like, oh, let's just forget about these. To have those kind of be like the standout focal points of your team is very interesting. Like you don't typically see this, you know? Um, yeah, I like no. how much it's um it's very pronounced without being overdone. Yeah. yeah. And mean? even even this is a desaturated yellow, so it looks very it looks pretty good in my opinion. But I'm colorblind, so I always have to ask people who can actually see stuff. So <laughs> You gotta trust them too, so that they're not gonna like this is dog shit, but I'm gonna steal this recipe. It's amazing. You know? Yeah, this yeah, the shit's the shit's actually the shit actually sucks, but I'm gonna tell them it's good. You know, <laughs> I need them to fail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as colorblind people de- depend on, uh, depend on normal people to, to, you know, see good stuff. And now I'm not really colorblind to yellow, so it shouldn't be an issue, but it kind of starts to go into the brown aspect, which can lead me to some problems. So this is one of the reasons. Um, yeah. So that, that was quite a fun project to be working on. Um, is really trying to up that and then get a lot of different skin tones to be painted onto the team and using some new silvers, you know, from hobby Highlander, which is a uh, fantastic and fun, but um, yeah. So I think we've gone through everything that is just kind of like run of the mill stuff that we're just catching up on since we've been both been so busy, but um, you want to move on to some, to some stats. I do. I do want to move on to some stats because I want to see how these new teams are performing and what's currently doing well still. Yeah. So, uh, G, if you could tune into my screen, we can check these out right now. I can see the screen. So it looks like we have, we'll sort everything with, um, how many tournament showings everything currently has. 
Uh, right now, it looks like the team. So, unfortunately, currently, we don't have as much data as in the last set. We did LVO produced a shit ton of data, right? We had 1,500 games itself. And right now, I think we're sitting at 2,200 or 2,600 games total. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that's a lot less <laughs> to say the least. So, uh, and we're about, when did it release? About a month ago? The balance data slate or the teams? The balance data slate. About a month ago. Okay. So we're about a month into this data slate and the team with the most showings, I'll only go over the top six for each one, is Phobos with 20 tournament showings. Hell yeah. We have Commandos next, so they're still very popular. Mm. Um, Hyratech, Warp Coven, and then Legionary. All right, cool. And then Intercession. So some. So there's still quite a few few interesting ones. Now we're going to look at total games because that might be very different and it sure is. When Intercession showed up to play, they showed up. Let me tell you what. There's a they are the most taken team currently with nearly 200 games. Nice. Uh Commandos are second most with uh, 184, so they definitely have fallen in popularity. The only people playing now are like the true like the orc lovers are like I'm still Dude, this like is commandos. fucking insane. Next is Phobos, then Hierotech, then Legionary. We have Intercession, Phobos, and then Legionary, which are all elite teams. And people, I guess, think elite are good now? They like them. I mean, hey, you know, play what you like, whatever. All right. So let's look at Intercession's um, win percentage. Look wow. at that number, Giacomo. Hey, I said play what you like, not play because it's going to win. <laughs> Intercession, the most taken team right now. 37.04% win rate with 200 games. Out of 194 games, they only have 72 wins. If but they, I guess they've placed twice, but they... I guess they've, they've placed twice. So... Two of the people did decently with them. Commandos with a 43% win rate. Still insanely solid. So they dropped nearly 10 percentage points in, in win percentage. But we're going to get to something that's... We're going to get to placing percentage here shortly. Phobos with a 45% win rate. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hyratech with a 45% win rate. Now, was that, that, that went up, right? <laughs> Uh, no, it's actually went down. Really? Yeah. I think they ended the last one at 51%. Wow. Now they're down to 45. Everyone's playing them now, you know? Right. So now the, the teams, maybe the players aren't as skilled with them yet. So it brings the numbers down just a day. Yeah. They have 40 unique players currently. So, um, and then we have Legionary with a 41% win rate. And then guess what? Felgor with a 52. Hey, there they are. Hey, wow. fellas. They're still a problem. Still a problem. Um, before we move on to these teams, let's talk about their their placing percentages. So, Intercession has a drastically higher placing percentage currently than they did last set, uh, last um, data slate with a thirteen percent uh, placing percentage, which is relatively like where you would want a team, right? Maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower. Well, guess where Orc Commandos are. Well, I can see the numbers, so can you tell yeah. the audience what it is? Uh, f- sure. Well, we're going to ask them. What do you guys think? Yell out a random number. Last set, last set it was uh, 52%. I'm going to act like I heard you, and I'm just going <laughs> to tell you now. Uh, they're sitting at a 36% placement rating, placing placement percentage. So placement percentage is how many times did they show up to a tournament compared to how many times did they place Right. So 36% of the time they're showing up to a tournament and they're placing. So they have the same issue that Vetguard did last, uh, last, uh, last time. So Vetguard were sitting at a 46% win rate and had a 30% placement rating. So I wonder if commandos are going to get nerfed again because that's what happened to Vetguard. Everything should be fair, right, Giacomo? Well, Vetguard only got seven <laughs> wounds and don't really have a way to do just a scratch. They can stay alive for a second, but then die after. 
Uh, Notice how commandos are surprisingly durable. Notice how Vet Guard are not on any of these yet. Because they're uh, not they, surprisingly durable. Not the no, same way that Orc Commandos are. Vet Guards still have a really high per- win percentage, which is interesting, but we'll get to that. Um, so I'm just talking shit. Phobos. Uh, 10% placement rating. So Intercession is placing better than them currently. Yeah, yeah. Then we have uh, Hyrotech with a 31% placement rating. So again, nice. um, still really good players on Commandos and still really good players on Legionary, and uh, not Legionary, Hyrotech, even though their teams are performing suboptimally. And then we go to Legionary. Remember, these are the most popular teams, right? Legionary have a 12% placement rating. Mm. And then Felgor have a 38% placement rating. Jesus Christ. <laughs> they, so, they, it's almost a 40% guarantee you're going to... A thirty-eight percent guarantee of placing is is still really hot. When we're saying like thirteen is good, you know. I mean, it's like triple or at least at least double. Even if you like say like, hey, I want every team to perform at twenty percent, right? Like thirty-eight percent is still nearly double that. So we that's, have that's so good. Orc commandos, Hyrotech, both with uh, really poor win percentages. 45 and 43 and then Felgor with a 52% win rate and a 38.46. So what this is showing me is that still the average player can take him to a tournament and go two and two, but a good player can place with them. So what's interesting is Felgor have one total tournament win, five total placings. So they're not winning a lot of tournaments, which is probably a good thing, but they are placing relatively well. So um, I don't know what this category is. Undefeated. Okay. Um, What's interesting is their undefeated category is uh, four. So they're not scoring enough total points to actually win the events, which is interesting. Interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. So let's move on to Vedguard because I'll talk about them just tad. Uh, they have a, well, let's just do win percentage. We'll probably be able to talk about them then. Yeah. So win percentage, they are one, two, three, four, five. They're fifth, fifth on the win percentage. Wow. Which is, and that's a pretty good win percentage. Which is interesting. Yeah. So they have 91 total games with 22 unique players, which is half of the unique players as intercession. Um, so people are still taking them to tournaments. They have a 54% win rate, which is 10 percentage points higher. So apparently I'm just bad at the game and need to learn how to play them. Um, and they have a 21% placement rating, which is a little bit lower than they were last. They were, they were at 30%. So again, we're dealing with nearly a third of the data. So these things will obviously change quite heavily. Right. Coming up, but you know, it is what it is right now. So in first place with only seven unique players and four total tournament showings and 28 total games, we have, uh, which is a very low, um, pool to kind of get from. Correct. Um, is Mandrix with a 64% win rate. I expect this. I'm, I'm impressed by the numbers, but I kind of expect this number to come down closer to like a 52, 54 range. Once more players have finished putting the team together and start taking them to tournaments. I may disagree with you. And the really? reason, the reason why is when warp coven first came out. Um, the very first weekend, they had a 72% win rate. They currently are now second highest with a 58% win rate. Um, pretty popular team with 90 games, about the same as, as, uh, as VetGuard. Um, is it the same as VetGuard? 58 yes, uh, versus 54? Or are you talking about games they played? Total, total games they've played. Oh, uh, yeah. It's just off by like one. Uh, one game, it looks one like. Game. Nine, yeah. 90 to 91. Yeah. So like, um, 
I, I kind of expected that, right? Like I'm, I'm just giving a number for the drop off. Yeah. I expect them to drop off a certain amount. Like I was thinking. 10%. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I can see still, them. It's still, if you're like 54% win rate, that's still incredible. Yeah. Like I could easily see them dropping to between 54 and 58%. I still think the team's really good. Um, but I still think they are probably S tier, right? Like I think they so. are on average scoring the most amount of points currently, even though they only have 28 games compared to, you know, some other teams. Um, I mean, what are the teams that have played less total games than them? Chaos Colts only with half. <laughs> but still at 52%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Strike Force Justian. Uh, I don't really count them as anything anymore. Yeah. Sure, they had a little bit of a flash of the pan and then a second one when they were like, hey, uh, Walmart's selling them or Target's selling them on their website right now at normal prices. Yeah. But uh, no one's really... You're getting it for the collection. You're not taking it for tournaments. Interesting statistics of Warp Coven. They have a 58% win percentage. But only 11.1%... 11.11 placement percentage. So they're showing up to a lot of tournaments. But they're not actually winning a lot which makes which makes sense because i remember saying that a lot of players are going to dust them off and start playing them again i get uh, you it's just a dust i get it oh yeah <laughs> and uh <laughs> and they're gonna they're gonna start you know not doing the hottest right not everyone can win that's why there's only one winner at the end correct so so they're gonna not place but they're still gonna perform relatively well because the team is just naturally strong again well, what's interesting is there's only been two tournament wins with them and two top placings. So that means the only times that Warp Coven has actually placed is when they've won. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So next up is Blooded. Blooded. That's surprising. Yeah. Blooded have a, uh, a 57% win rate. It makes sense because a lot of their natural predators have gotten nerfed. Right. So they're performing better because of that. They are also being taken about the same as Warp Coven and Blooded. So it seems about the average is about 90-ish games currently. 50% uh, placement rating. Placing, though. Yeah, they do. They have a real good placing. <laughs> yeah, they do. That's a lot. That's really high. Dang. 50%. Half the time you will podium some way. I think that's actually probably the highest with the most amount of games. We'll 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 talk about that in a second. And the Archon's doing really well as well. They have a 56% win rate. 102 games total and a placement percentage of 21.43, the exact same as Vetguard. It's that disciple, man. The disciple mm-hmm. just she does work. Mm-hmm. And then the Novitiates are right after them that's with a 53% surprising. Uh, well, Vetguard and then Novitiates um, with a 25% placement rating. So they're still really, really good. Uh, and then we have Felgor and then we have Nemesis Claw in seventh. Nice. So uh, Nemesis Claw have also have a 50%, but they have 19 total games. So they don't also don't have very many. I wonder, just one more than Mandrakes. I wonder if people have figured out like to abuse their obscuring thing where you just don't hide behind cover, but you're within an inch of it, so therefore you're obscured as long as you're further than six. Yeah. And maybe they haven't. They've been playing it normally, so then an opponent can get on advantage and get rid of their thing. Um, I'm just saying, if you want to be sweaty, you play it like this until eventually GW probably fixes this problem, because that's a problem that doesn't... Um, that shouldn't exist. They may not fix it. They, they may, may not, just... but I think mm-hmm. it's a problem that should be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to. I'm play the. I want to play the team. Like even I think this thing's got to go. That's kind of busted. <laughs> like I always explain it to players now, so that when I do play it, they go, "Remember that rule I was mentioning? I'm about to do it right now." I'm just. Yeah. I'm getting them warmed up, so they. They. You know, they don't get surprised when I do it. So then we'll do place percentages, and then we'll go through and we'll talk. We'll we'll say every team and their current win percentage because that's what GW matter cares about the most. So currently in first place is the Mandrakes with a 50% placement rating. Then we have Blooded with a 50% placement rating, which is insane. That's that's literally orcs from last uh, last time. Uh, we have Nemesis Claw with a 50%. Hell Felgor yeah. with a 38 and fourth. Also hell yeah. Then Orc Commandos. 
orc commandos from placement went from first to fifth. Really? That's it. And then Chaos Colts, then Hunter Clade, then Hyrotech, then Wormblade. Uh, Kasserkin, surprisingly. Wow. They're trying to become the kings, you know? Mm-hmm. Caster Kings, they're trying to. Uh, I just want to mention the asterisk on Mandrix and uh, Nemesis Claw since they're still relatively. Yeah, we er, pretty much shouldn't really count them because it just goes like it should be blooded, then Felgor, then Commandos. Wow, so Commandos those are still top three players. Wow. Yeah, it didn't like blooded is surprising. They jumped up there. I thought they would be good. You know what I mean? But um, they kind of jumped up a lot more than I thought they would, to say the least. I mean, you made a good um, point, right? Like their natural predators are currently not at the top or being played as much. So they're going to, they're going to spike up a bit. Now let's go down to the, um, the zero percentage of teams real quick. Exaction squad, 0% placement rating. If you take them, you're not going to place. They only have 36 total games. They are struggling to find play. Hmm. Then we have Corsair Void Scars with 106 games. They have just as many as Blooded. And um, they have 0% places. I'm so sad that they're they're performing that way. Like, But isn't that always kind of been a problem with Corsairs is they just lack the, the little thing that might push into place. Like they always do well. They, they never, need a second gunner. It's just that simple. They're uh, never going to win anything until they get a second gunner. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Yeah. <laughs> it's just always hand of the archon will always be better than them. It's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. At least void dancers are still placing. Next up, we have strike force Justian with also a zero percent. Makes sense. It's, uh, like I mentioned, it's more of a toy team that people buy, but uh, maybe don't really play. Mm. This is kind of bad. So we're going to go over the next three bottom teams. Next up, that's great. Mark is down in that book once again. (laughs) Those Hearthkin lovers, you're in the bottom once again. There's only been one player who placed in the top. They did not go undefeated. Um, And they have a total of 84 games. Again, similar to Vetgarden. And pretty much the majority it's a lot of these teams but uh you know with one showing they have an eight percent placement rating so and a 36 percent win rate it's their little legs man they have their little legs man it's it's literally the little legs uh next up we have far stalker kinban also still on the struggle bus it's almost like we said in meta watch on our youtube channel um (laughs) That they buff the wrong things. They keep buffing the damage. They keep buffing everything. And uh, now the one person who won with them who did go undefeated and won his tournament or her tournament. Whoever you are, great job. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for you, they would be sitting at 0%. So you are the, the, hearth, <laughs> the Kroot King. Uh, <laughs> and then, then we have, unfortunately, a very, very, very popular team. With Phobos. That That's makes right. Sense. Phobos has a 10% placement rating. Uh, they have 173 games, so nearly double from most of the teams that we've talked about so far, and they have a 45% win rate. Farstalker have a, has a 47, so it's interesting. Makes sense. The team has a lot of tools, but um, mayhaps not always uh, winning, you know? If you don't use the tools just right, then you fall apart. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go over the... Um, the the finale of this, um, we're going to go over just win percentages and what teams um, have that win percentage, and then we'll we'll kind of go from there. So, um, G, do you want to take us through a couple of these? Yeah, you want me to start from the bottom or the top? It's up to you. Whatever you think is um, most interesting. Uh, definitely. Well, we've already said that one. But I want to say it again, because uh, I am impressed that uh, my boys from the sand are doing as well as they are after suffering for so long. Uh, Warp Coven at 58. You know, still impressive, even though I've already read it a bunch now, because I've been looking at the screen for a while. Still we're gonna impressed. Ignore, we're going to ignore Mandrakes and Nemesis Yes, yes just because, uh, you know, they're, they're performing well, but... Um, 
Not enough 60, data to really to you know to say yeah, that's a good enough score. Sixty four percent win rate and a fifty two percent win rate it's, it's for the two nuts. of them. Pretty nuts. But Warp Coven, they're they're surprising me. And I think we were talking with Kellen, and he had said he's a his words. I'm a dirty meta chaser, and he was playing Warp Coven. Um, so you know the man knows how to play the game, and if he thinks that's where they're going, I would uh, I would trust him. You know, I'd put money on Kellen. Kellen also said that. Um, Exaction Squad was S tier once. The man has learned, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You'll never live it down, Kellen. Um, no, yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed with Warp Coven. How about you <laughs> with some, some, something else on this board? I didn't think that they would maintain this high for so long. I thought they would have dropped faster. What's interesting is that they have a really high percent win percentage, but they're not placing. So a lot of people are going three and one, and they're just not scoring enough points. What is their average score per game? Their average score is 16.33 per game, which puts them... Where would they be? They're kind of in the middle, a little little high, high mid. Yeah, they're in the middle. So they're they're like 13th or 14th in average plays uh score, which would make sense if you're not score if you're not maxing out every game. It's pretty difficult to actually win a tournament. So um it's interesting to see them have such a high win rate, but their placement percentage is not good, and I personally if I was a game developer, I would not know how to fix that. Um, just let it take its course, right? And what else can you do? You just we just need more it, data. You yeah. gotta let it change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I get what I see what you did there. There you go. You know, they'll change back to bad at some point, but right now they're in the good spot. And I'm happy for them, you know? I, I like, I like Thousand Suns. Am I gonna play them now? No, but I like, I'd like for people to, who have them to get to play with their models. I think that's pretty cool. And not feel bad at the end of the day. I'm waiting Absolutely. for uh, Alex Popov to whip him out, you know, and the, the retire Inquisition. So I don't have to deal with goddamn absolute authority all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, you know, Warp Coven, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm impressed that they did as well as they did on this page. Uh, I handed the Archon another one that's close at 56, because before I don't think they were as high. So they've been uh, they've been stepping it up a lot. Well, it goes Warp Coven with 58, then Blooded Correct. with 57 and 50, which they seem like they're the kings of the meta at the moment. And then handed the Archon, which is the third, you know, technically third if we don't count the Mandrakes. Mm-hmm. Like they're really they're gunning for that. And veteran guardsmen, you know, still hasn't yep, dropped off with a with a 54 percent. Still hasn't dropped Somehow off. Somehow they got better. You just you don't necessarily need to. So what I think what, what what I think happened was that only people that were really good with the teams kept with the team. I have no fucking idea. I'm not gonna lie, no I, idea. Pol- Poland people really Polish really like that card, right? I think it yeah. was. So maybe maybe all our Polish uh, players out there are uh, sticking it to us and saying veteran guardsman is uh, is still the best. And uh, maybe they're showing us, or heck, even even people out here and in Canada. You know? Apparently, I just have to get good, you know? You gotta get good, Scrub. Yep. I mean, there's Next a lot. up, we have uh, Novitiates with uh, 53%. See, this makes sense, because the teams that are above them, they can do pretty good damage to. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the teams they might struggle into, like uh, Elites, Felgor. Aren't, aren't in Felgor, um, aren't necessarily being played as much after some of the nerfs. So they're in a good spot to reclaim their title or at mm-hmm. least do, or at least do really well. And then, you know, you can enjoy yourself with your nuns. Next up, we have Felgor Ravagers at 52% with uh, a 38% placement rating. St- I mean, <clears throat> still a solid, strong team, you know, like you have to shoot me twice off the board is, is still, it's annoying. So I get it. Then we have Chaos Cultists at 51%. Then we have Gellerpox with 51%. Then Hunterclade with 50%. 
and then Wormblade with 49%, which is surprising to me. They do have a 33%, a 30% placement rating. Ooh, literally one, like a th- almost a third. And then, I mean, Chaos Cultists have 33%, but very few games. Geller Pox also have a, no, Hunter Clade also have a 33%. So that's just showing that they're pretty good. Compendium, since we're adding that in there now, is sitting at um, a 48% win rate total, 21% placement rating. Which we have Who to knows? assume is mostly uh, what uh, Custodes and Tyranids are probably Custodes, the two most played ones from there. Tyranids, um, Guard, shit, we had a Guard team win our tournament. That's right, yeah, just play, <laughs> playing Jonathan Guard. Marquis. Yeah, yep. hey. It happens every Void, day. Void Dancers dropped 10 percentage points. In play because normally they would place, right? 40 they they ended the last data set, data slate at 58% win rate or 56. Uh they end they're now sitting at a 48%. Almost 10 points down. Mm-hmm. And only 11% placement rating. So not only has this knocked them to where GW uh, GW likes them at this number, right? Now, unfortunately, we're going to get to a thing, a point where there's only one, two, three, four, four teams currently outside of the 50% win rate. There's a lot of teams below the 45. So we will get to those soon. So next up is Farstalker Kinban with a 47% win rate. Again, on the lower end, it's sad that we're halfway through the list and we're already at 47%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's going to happen, right? Like, there's going to be a percentage of teams that are just like the ones that will win because they're doing well. And a lot of players are going to play the team that does well because, you know, they want to win. I get it. You would, I would think a healthy meta would be halfway down the list. We're still in the 50s. Just my opinion. So, um, or we're, we're still like at 50 or 49 or 51. So Blades of Cain sitting at 46% win rate and a 15% placement rating. Uh, They've been seeing troubles. A lot of people think they're bad, but I think they're really good in um, specific people's hands. People who are built for this team. Uh, We have Kasserkin at a 46% win rate, uh, 28% placement rating. So they have definitely jumped up. They were... Sitting pretty low, and their placement rating was nowhere near as high. Uh, next up is Inquisition. They are fucking sucking right now. Uh, again, uh, that's that's just a team that I think is um, it's there's so much going on with the team all the time when you play them mm-hmm. that um, it's hard to train with them. Yeah. So you're going to make those mistakes at some point, and um, you're not going to maybe take the optimal choice each time, especially because if that guard changes or you know if a team changes, then what was your original strategy is now thrown out the window. So you have to relearn it, which um, can be hard. They have the most changes to deal with all the time. You know, the most changes that happen in a data slate and then the most changes that like you just have to deal with, with the headaches. So I get yeah. why the team doesn't do necessarily better. Shit. They're at a 45% win rate. It's not, the wor- it's not the worst, nine. but it's like, uh, you know, they, they have the potential to win it all because they have all the tools. Yeah. Well with them as well, they, They've really only buffed Kashikin and they keep nerfing some of their other teams. So, I mean, we'll have to see. Uh, their placement rating is at 14.29. So, not great. It's, I, I would say it's about average. So, this is probably a decent spot for them to be, other than they are sitting at a 45% win rate. So, we have how many teams? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14. Half. Almost half of the teams, we have 30 teams currently, sitting at 45% and below. Indeed. So next up, we have Strike Force Justian coming in strong at, uh, you know, in 17th place out of 28. We have them at a a 45% win rate. Wow, they're doing better than Phobos, who we ranked really highly in our stats last time. So uh, Phobos, uh, m- everyone must have li- watched my video, went out and tried to play them and f- found out how hard they are. <laughs> they are they are a hard team. They make a mistake and, you know, two guys are dead and it's over. Yeah. Um, Pathfinders. 
Um, it looks like this one tournament win must be Chris Bakke this past weekend. So they've only had one tournament win. Classic um, Bakke. Classic Bakke. Bring, making a team so that they have to, you know, so they can't get a buff. Thank you, Bakke, for, for making sure that Pathfinders don't get buffed again. Um, <laughs> sitting at a 45.43% win rate. This is surprising to me because they have been sitting at 50% for quite some time. Again, I mean, they have 109 games, which is about average. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty low win rate for a team that I think is really, really good. But again, one of the hardest teams to pilot. Uh, then we have Higher Tech Circle at a 45% win rate. That's uh, because Shane isn't playing them. Shane's not playing them, so they're not, they're not... Well, I take that back. They have a 31% placement rating. So that is interesting. Star Striders is coming up next with a, uh, we finally hit the sub 45% win rate. The Lucidity and Star Striders have a uh, 44% win rate. Ooh, what a drop off. And a 15% placement rating. So they are doing about average in placings, bad in win rate. Uh, typically means that um, people that are playing them well are piloting, piloting them sufficiently while they are struggling in the majority of players' hands. We move on to Orc Commandos, who is also in the same boat with a 43% win rate. Even with a 43% win rate, they are ninth from the bottom. Yeah. Eighth from the bottom, I apologize. <clears throat> and a 36% win rate uh, per, for, for, for placement percentage. Well, once so, those abusive abilities were gone, you know, like... The players who are doing that are like, I'm out, and I'm going to choose something else now that's at the top. Yeah, and then you just have the the diehard commando players still placing well with them because it looks like they're not bad after all. What's interesting is Corsairs and Exaction Squad, both with a 0% placement rating, have a better win rate than the rest of our teams on this list. So Corsairs have a 43% win rate, and then we have Exaction Squad with a 41% placement rating. Um, man, exaction is just in a really bad, bad spot. I right just now. don't know what to do to fix it. 36 games and they've been out the entire time. It's not like Mandrakes have almost caught them and passed them. And they've been out for like people probably painted and played them, you know, and again, our data is pulling from tournaments of 16 players or more, right? So, um, so maybe in some- and four rounds and four right. rounds. It's crazy. Next up is Navy Breachers, who are also uh, at the bottom of the ocean. Um, down. Man, they, yeah. were, they were mighty when they came out. 41.67%. I don't know. Give them another wound. Make stims great again. I don't know. Um, one player has piloted them, piloted them undefeated and won tournament. Uh, 11% placement percentage. So just one game, you know, or just one time, uh, they have a 48 games total. So also pretty piss poor. I Uh, think, I think teams like that, that have pets should, if you take their, their, their master, you should get their pet for free and have it as like a GA two ability. I can see that. Right. Just like, you know, what's the point of taking the void Smith and now I got to take like the guy skull. Like, well, that's a waste because the guy skull is going to explode at some point. Um, and then uh, a star striders get the dog for free. Yeah. Let's like you, cause you get the person who's like, uh, you know, a dog guy. Well, you get yeah. the whole team for free. It doesn't matter. Actually. Star striders. Yeah. You just get it. Maybe for like, bre- for uh, not breaches for um, exaction. If you take the leash master, you get the dog, you know, and then yeah. GA two or something, which I think they sort of do. Right. Yeah, I think so. Something like that. So legionary again at the bottom of the barrel, sucking, sucking on their last dying breaths. Nemesis uh, 40, coming for them. 41%. Now, the crazy thing is that they have a lot of games played, 160, but they still don't have the most amount of games played, uh, which is uh, <laughs> it's so stupid. Let me tell you something fun that's going to be exciting about these teams who have so many games played uh, in a second. Next up, we have Scout Squad, third from the bottom in 27th place. With a 39% win rate. They got the uh, keys in the first, you know, in round zero, and then you don't really know what else to do rounds one, two, three, and four. 
And Austin is, in one of our tournaments is one of the top placers for this uh, for this team. They only have two, so he was one of them. Uh, if you don't win round one with scouts, you're not going to win the game. And it's really hard just to win round one. You have to be extremely, extremely aggressive. So, um, and that fits his play style pretty well. So, uh, if if you're not playing scout squad super aggressive on turn one, you're probably not playing them right. Um, because we've seen success come from that team before. I, at one of our tournaments, uh, he scored nearly perfect score in the first three games and only... Uh, lost to uh, Compendium Guard, which we still tease to him about to this day. Um, yeah, second from the bottom with the most popular faction, thirty-seven percent win rate is Intercession. Hey, this feels right at home. It's the team most players would probably be given because they're like friends have submarines, and it's the one easiest to collect. It's six models. It's not hard to you buy a box. There's not really a lot of conversions you got to do. And Space Marines are one of the faces of this game. So naturally, you're going to be like, what's a Homie, Space they're, Marine? They're averaging nine primary points a game. Makes sense. Smaller numbers. They don't necessarily love loot. Um, yeah, that feels right. Feels right at home for them. Yeah, not. Not particularly good. Uh, the team is really hurting, really needed a buff. And unless the Games Workshop comes out and gives them like uh, a buff here pretty soon, uh, this team is going to continue to struggle quite quite aggressively. Same. And then the only team worse than them uh, yes, the, is our boys with short legs. Our boys with short legs. Boys and girls with short legs. They just... Yeah, I really do think... It's the five inch move that holds them back. Homie, fucking Hearthkin are in the mines of Moria right now, and they're struggling for their last breath as all the goblins are coming for them. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're not doing well. Um, maybe they'll jump up in win rate if like Jaeger, Jaegers get like super popular. Like, but then they'll be Jaegers. They won't be Hearthkin, you know? No, no. I'm saying like Hearthkin. I think Hearthkin are going to beat Jaegers. Oh, you think so? they're like the direct counter, something like that? Yeah, okay. I could. The reason I why I th- uh, the reason why I think that is because, um, you know, Hearthkin Hearthkin don't allow people to you know start outside of their their uh, deployment zones, and apparently Jaegers are supposed to be able to start outside of the deployment zone. I'm guessing four inches because they kind of uh, from beta decima at least. Mm, yeah, from beta decima. So. Uh, I would say that that's probably probably a safe guess. We will see when that comes out, but at the mm-hmm. moment, our boys and girls with short legs are uh, well. They just need to. They just need that extra inch, man. Honestly, they're on the they're on the slow bus. That's it's, for sure. It's, it's rough. Any team that moves four inches is rough. Like and I, Hyrotech can only do it because of the one spell that lets them move faster if they're all in engage or their ability or something. Dude, if you're going to a tournament, you're averaging like. One and a half wins, not even out of four games. They're oh my goodness, it's so bad. They're just in a they're just in a bad spot, and that's okay. Play them because you like them, not because you yeah. want to win a tournament. Yeah, yeah. Play them because you you enjoy them. They are the for fun score tier right now. Yep, in the for so, fun tier. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting to see where these start to shape out uh, around halfway through. The data slate. Um, I mean, I don't know if we want to do it right after Dallas or when the next Meta Watch is going to come out, but we will stream it live on Twitch um, and then post it up to YouTube if you can't catch it. So it should be good, should be exciting, should be right around hopefully mid data slate. Um, We'll have to see, you know, and then we'll we'll have a wrap up as well and see where what Games Workshop thinks, you know. So absolutely. Well, yeah. we come to that time. I think so. Do you have anything to shout out? Well, um, if you haven't watched uh, any of our other content outside of our podcast, I implore you to give us uh, a like, uh, a subscribe, or uh, a comment that will help us reach a lot more people. Uh, engagement is really popular, really important for YouTube. And um, you know, if you don't, if you don't consume YouTube. Then uh, give us a you know a five star review to wherever you're listening to your podcasts from, 
por favor. And uh, yeah, looking looking forward to a deep dive next week with a uh, you know with Pathfinders. Yeah, I look forward to that. Uh, and, and for my for my send offs before we get out of here, you can find me on Instagram at wargaming underscore studio. I'm going to do that that test of using Monument Hobbies Pro Acryl as much of their Pro Acryl line as I can, because obviously there might be some colors I just want to use for other things. But I will try to use as many with as much of the Pro Acryl products as well to really. Give them their fair share, you know. I think they 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 deserve it. They're a great paint line. Um, I think uh, I think they just need that extra tip. That extra tip, and of course, uh, you can follow us on Discord. Join the conversation there. Link in the description, or you can just find us the Squad Games Discord. You know, share it with a friend. Share this episode with a friend. Something like that. If you think they'll get benefits from it, and if you want to help us on a more personal level, you can join us on Patreon. Uh, any little thing like that helps us out, and we always really appreciate it. And shout out to our Patreon members. They uh, really do a lot for this whole series, this show, the stuff on YouTube, and uh, heck, even some of our events. And we really appreciate them. Absolutely. Well, until next time, everyone, uh, that's Squad Games signing out. See ya. The Squad Games Podcast is a production of Squad Games Entertainment. For more information on Squad Games, please visit our website at lustersworkshop.com slash squad dash games.